Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful this day for everything that you are, for who you are, for all that you've done for us, for all the many blessings that we received. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. I just ask that you would strip away all that which is foolish but seal to our hearts, that which is truth, the truth that you would have us know, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Happy Thanksgiving 2022. I was asked what I'm thankful for the most. I would have to say the Word. Uh, without the Word of God, that we probably wouldn't have any, any reason to give thanks for anything. We've been studying together uh, these parables, and I think this is going to be part three or part four. I can't, I can't really remember, but uh, we're going to be looking at several parables in this video. I hope you'll find them uh, this this teaching uh, encouraging. Uh, I've spent a lot of time emphasizing the fact that this is God's word. It's 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 not. Matthew's word or Mark's or Luke's or or Paul's it's God's word and I've spent some time emphasizing the importance of context so that we don't misapply these verses uh, we don't mistranslate and, and the application, we don't get the application wrong. Uh, sometimes we see ourselves in these parables, uh, the church. Sometimes we don't. Uh, in fact, most of the time we don't, but we can learn a lot from uh, this change of dispensations that's occurring as we go through these, uh, these wonderful passages that deal with these uh, particular parables. I've spent some time explaining what a parable is, what its purpose is, and, uh, and why Jesus spoke in parables, uh, so that those who would believe would hear and those who did not believe would not. And so I'd like to, to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 9 uh, to start out with the, the new cloth on the old garment. The text says no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. Uh, now they pour new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. Uh, the, the word new there literally means uh, raw. Uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, quite simply that the old garment uh, is Judaism. We're looking at this in context. Now, I understand I have an old man uh, that does nothing but sin, and I have a new man who cannot sin. And, and it's easy to just to make that application directly to us without looking at the context, and the context is, is just as important as anything else. Uh, <coughs> Christianity uh, is not to be pieced on to Judaism to fill up its deficiencies. You know, that would make the, the tear, uh, the, the, that would make the, the divisions of Judaism uh, uh, still more serious. The word translated tear or rent, uh, if you're using the authorized version, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually the same word as used of the divisions within the Corinthian church uh, in the first chapter of, of First Corinthians. And so that's, that word sort of passed into, uh, it passed into ecclesiastical language, and it's the English word where we get uh, uh, schism or division. Uh, so our Lord says my new doctrines 
don't match with the old rites of the Pharisees. You know, there's, there's a fitness of things. Uh, uh, their doctrines require much fasting. If you look at the context, this is what we read above, before it, uh, was their fasting. Uh, the Lord is basically saying that in my system, uh, this fasting would be uh, incongruous. And, and if my new doctrines were to, to be attached to, their, to these old ones, it would only make the matter worse. Uh, now, if you come ahead to today, to us, the church, I would say that there's the application there is most definitely uh, speaking to us concerning the old man and the new man. Um, if uh, you know our our, uh, you can't patch up the the flesh. You can't. God isn't trying to working to try to clean up the old man. Uh, we've been crucified with Christ. He, he put us to death. We, when Christ died, we died with Him. We were buried with Him, raised with Him uh, to walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Not in some patched up life. Some, uh, some life that, that God looks at uh, or that he sees, well, you know, there's this really bad stuff in your in your life, and that he's got to he's got to work to kind of clean that up. We we started out, folks, on the right foot here. The God started us out on the right foot by making us the righteousness of God in Christ. We couldn't be any more righteous than what we already are uh, in Christ. In fact, I've often said that if that God looks at, when He looks at us, He sees us as righteous as His Son. And the only reason that He is able to do that is because we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Our new garment is spotless and blameless. These, uh, these Pharisees, they, they looked at themselves as, uh, as very righteous persons. And they looked at, pretty much looked at all the rest of everybody else as sinners. And so to exp expose their, their, their folly, Christ delivers this parable. Wherefore, by the old garment, that's, that's meant uh, their moral and their legal righteousness or their obedience to the moral and, and uh, ceremonial laws, uh, which was very imperfect as, as well as impure. And so, you know, they might be rightly called filthy rags, or uh, uh, be compared to an old worn out garment, uh, filthy, uh, torn, full of holes, uh, which can't keep a person warm, uh, can't screen him from the weather, uh, so old that it can't be mended. And by the piece of, of new cloth or garment put, put, uh, uh, put on it or sewed on it, uh, that's or are intended the the uh, traditions of the elders. Uh, these men were so fond of uh, uh, the traditions that they were just so fond of, you know, the concerning eating and drinking and fasting and hundreds of other things. You know, uh, not by putting or sewing the new cloth to their old garment. Uh, it, uh, it, it, to put to uh, to sew new cloth to their old garment uh, is uh, it, it would be them them sort of joining the together their observance of of these traditions that they held to other uh, aspects of Christianity, other truths that, that Christ taught, you know to sort of to make up for what was lacking, if you know, if you might could put it that way. Uh, but it would be all in vain, it would be to no purpose. Their old garment of their own, of their own works, of, of their obedience to the laws of God, the both moral, uh, ceremonial, was, was really bad enough of itself, but it, it, would, it became ab abundantly worse 
by uh, joining this new piece to that. Now that's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, there were that's how that's how I'm looking at that. Uh, many of you probably understand that the Pharisees they had fence laws. They didn't just have laws. They created new laws that would. Uh, which they called uh, fence laws, or we call fence laws, which would uh, prevent them from even coming anywhere near to, you know, breaking the laws of God. You know, it would be like me putting up a fence inside a fence to, you know, to keep my horse from getting out, you know, so I, I double the, the fence, you know, it's, it's just to keep my horse from getting anywhere close to getting outside the fence. They had fence laws. You know, uh, we know that Christ's righteousness is the only justifying righteousness. We know that, that it's, that it's whole, it's, it's perfect, it, it doesn't need anything added to it. Uh, there's no justification of works. Uh, we're not justified by works. Uh, not in whole or in part. Uh, the old garment of man's righteousness uh, has to be thrown away. Uh, it can't be mended. You know, if you try to do that, then the, the terror becomes worse. And we're told by Paul that the Apostle Paul, that God spoke to us and said to us through the Apostle Paul that the very strength of sin is the law. The very strength of sin is the law. I don't know how to emphasize enough to you folks that despite what mainstream Christianity today ad holds, believes, adheres to, the law will not serve one purpose in your life as far as making you righteous or uh, attaining righteousness or maintaining righteousness on a human level. Uh, the example, the perfect example was given, was, has already been displayed. And that was that uh, God gave the law to Israel. They couldn't keep it. And, and now for some strange, odd reason, the church as a whole today and ha and ha believes and has believed for the longest time that we can, uh, that we, we are, God somehow makes us able to keep the law. God somehow makes us able to, well, uh, to, uh, to put new cloth on an old garment. Now, I look at this parable and, and uh, I see quite clearly, you know, that what he's really speaking of is it's, it's just nothing, no, I mean, nothing is more disagreeable than, than, than patchwork. You know, Christ's righteousness and a man's uh, uh, own attempt at, at performing right, uh, any righteous act, is uh, they, they don't bear any likeness uh, to one another at all. So there would be a, uh, it'd, it would just be a waste, a waste of time. An, an old piece or a piece like the garment, uh, uh, the well, as I said, the word translated "new" in the original means uh, it means uh, uh, that uh, that that new cloth is it hasn't passed through the cloth maker's hands. It's rough. It hasn't been prepared uh, to, and I and I think that's a beautiful illustration. Uh, the, uh, the word translated new in, in the original text means uh, undressed. Not, it's not fooled by the, by the cloth dresser in this state. So if it's applied to an old garment, uh, you know, if it was... Uh, uh, many of the commentators will suggest that, it, you know, if it's wet, it would, it would contract, it would draw off of part of the garment to which it was attached, and so it would make the tear worse. So basically, our Lord is saying, my new doctrines don't match with the old rites of the Pharisees. 
That's that's what I'm going to suggest here. There's a there's a there's a fitness of things. And, uh, their doctrines require much fasting. In my system, it just it doesn't. And so, if 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 my new teaching here was was attached, if it was to be attached to the old old uh, old ones, it, it would just only make the matters worse. And chapter fifteen. We're looking at a parable that's, uh, that they list this as the heart of man, Matthew 15, 10 through 20. Uh, Matthew 15, chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. And then the disciples, they come to him and they ask, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And he replies, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. I've pointed out before that what that's saying is, is that if, if you're a plant that he has planted, you cannot be rooted up. It just goes without saying. Leave them, he says, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. And, of course, Peter then asks the Lord to explain the parable. And he says, are you still so dull? Uh, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from a heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander these are what defile a person but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them folks we don't live by rules rules and regulations uh, we go back to verse one here in the text jesus came to uh, the scribes and pharisees which and, and he says why do why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Because they don't wash their hands when they eat, when they eat bread. And so he gives this parable. So clearly what the parable is teaching here is that there's, there's a change of dispensations going to take place here. It is taking place. We're not under law, but grace. All things are lawful but not all things are expedient, not all things are profitable. And, you know, there's no, there's no fence city here in this, uh, as far as this uh, subject goes. You, everyone must be either with Christ or against Him, is what the text says. You know, you're either a loyal subject or, or you're a rebel. You know, folks are, are going to either promote or obstruct his kingdom. That's, they're, only gonna, they're either going to do one or the other. Uh, and I think every one of us, every, everyone, does one or the other daily. Uh, so what's, what's really worse here, uh, I see in the text, what's, what's much more dangerous, much more fatal, much more uh, criminal, really, is uh, it has to be those, those who with uh, at deliberate malice oppose Christ's cause, and uh, they're, they're just resolved at all costs to do their utmost to bring it down, as the Pharisees were now attempting to do with these, with these insane suggestions. Uh, whereby they in, in, they endeavored to represent Christ who came to save men. It's really interesting how that, that uh, here you had our Lord Jesus Christ came to save, save His people. Matthew, right at the beginning of Matthew, He came unto His own. Uh, uh, he came to save His people from their sins. We read later on, He came unto His own, His own received Him not. Uh, But isn't it interesting how that uh, the way that the Pharisees worked, labored to present Christ was was uh, who, who came to save his people. Uh, that his accomplice was Satan, 
you know, the very one who was laboring to destroy them. Keep in mind, folks, that every miracle Jesus did was a foretaste of the kingdom under His rule, His reign. Uh, so it's not difficult to see the, the context in which we read these parables. The kingdom can't be separated from the miracles that Jesus performed, you know, without... Uh, you know, without without uh, without those uh, those miracles, uh, the kingdom can't be revealed. You know, miracles are a, are, are a manifestation of 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 God's sovereign power, uh, which He will uh, exercise during that that time in which he establishes his kingdom. Uh, that all this miraculous casting out of devils and, uh, you know, it, it's, is an event that's connected with the kingdom. Uh, this is what the message that was being preached at that time, you've got to keep in mind that there was no gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was no church, uh, there's no, no book of Acts, no Pentecost. Uh, we're looking at God coming to His own people and His own people was not receiving Him. And so uh, Israel is set aside in unbelief so that the salvation could come to us Gentiles. Uh, so that's how I'm looking at that parable. If we go over to Matthew chapter 18... Uh, the lost sheep it's, it's really one of my favorite parables uh, we need to cover that I'm trying to go through these uh, in order sort of as we go through Matthew I started in chapter 5 with the first parable uh, we're up to, to Matthew 18 I, w I, I wanted to, to somewhat lay some groundwork before I did this but but uh, so we're kind of going along now in chronological order uh, so we're now in Matthew chapter 18 the lost sheep See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now that's the first part of it. Uh, but then, but then he, he goes into uh, some dialogue concerning the lost sheep. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off and if he finds it truly I tell you he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off uh, oh man the 99 that did not wander off I wonder why the 99 did not wander off you know we, we tend to brush right over that we read right through that the, because the 99 can't wander off because he found them and I think that's marvelous. And we, we miss seeing these things in the text. But uh, truly, I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones, little ones should perish. And right away, we think of this as, uh, well, these, these, are, these are little children, preschoolers, uh, grade schoolers, uh, I guess we can carry that over to junior high, high school, any, anything, anybody under age 21 or 18 or whatever you want to make it. You know, these are, these are children that he's speaking. He's speaking. The parable includes children. It's using children as an example. He called a child over to sit on his knee. But it's not about children. It's not about, we're looking at a spiritual reality here that in which he's using a physical illustration of children. And I'm not by any means suggesting that children are not included in this, but the words, folks, have a wider range and they, and, and they, so it includes among the little ones, it includes the childlike as well as children. All 
of those whom Christ came to save. What's, what's added to the general fact here is that, uh, that those who have the guardianship of, of the little ones assigned to them uh, are among the most noble of the heavenly host. There, there is the, they're, they're, they're like the angels of the presence who, like Gabriel, they stand before the face of God and, and rejoice uh, in, in everything that God is doing. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, that is, one of those little ones that believed in Christ. You know, he's not speaking of infants in age, contrary to popular opinion. Now, of course, this is my opinion. You don't have to agree, agree with it. In fact, you do not have to agree with anything you hear here, okay? Uh, but that's how I read this. He's not speaking of infants in age, but of those who might be compared to them. You know, for, for because of their humility, because of their modesty, because of their innocence, uh, we are children of God. You know, little in their in their own eyes, uh, mean and and deplorable in the eyes of the world. In the uh, you know, but they also appeared little in the eyes of their fellow disciples and brethren. Now, this makes all the sense in the world, folks, when you consider the fact that of what the of, uh, once again context, okay. Uh, the Lord uh, addresses uh, his disciples. Uh, over this because they had they these disciples had been arguing amongst themselves over who was going to be greater in the kingdom uh, we just just go back to the very first verse so it's no wonder given the, the context given the fact that they were arguing who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom that the Lord would uh, would uh, be sp speaking in the way that he is. So they they were they're they're striving to lessen one another. You know, they each one of them were looking to himself as the greater, and and everybody else is is smaller. So Christ cautions them against such a spirit, and he bids them. Uh, Well, he just cautions them to, 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 to be, you know, to beware of despising their fellow disciples, you know, uh, as, you know, belittling them. Uh, they're smaller. They're, they're of less value. They, uh, they're, they're somehow below, beneath them. Uh, you know, the text is showing us how much care and concern and love that God has for these little ones uh, both in heaven and in earth. Now is there a, a present day application? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's just ingrained in us. It's a uh, <laughs> It's, it's just a natural manifestation of the flesh, the old man, to take and look at some as greater and others as lesser. Okay? Uh, it's just so easy to do that. And yet, we're cautioned against it, against this. So I think that the, the, the weaker that a brother is, the greater care we ought to have for him. I think the text is clearly saying that. 
uh, the charge here is, is not to neglect them, not to, to despise them, not to uh, belittle them, not to uh, look down on them. Because uh, our Heavenly Father has such a care for them. He's given His particular angels here in this context. It's not just angels in general, okay? A particular category of angels. He's given them charge over them. Uh, Psalms, I would, I would suggest you read Psalms chapter 34, Hebrews chapter 1. So they, they always behold the face of God, says the text. Okay. Now that's, that, is, that, word, that phrase is taken from the practice of earthly courts. You know, to be admitted to the presence of a king, to be allowed to see his face continually, to have free access to him at all times. Not everyone has that uh, in, in earthly courts, okay? Uh, these angels are said to. And now you could argue, well, Steve, that's, that's, that's great. That's wonderful for them. It's surely the same is true of us. The text will not allow me to say that. I believe that uh, we all have ministering spirits. There are angels who minister to us. They minister to us according to our needs. Mine are not the same as yours. Yours are not the same as theirs. If you are a Christian and you're being humiliated, despised, uh, thought less of, you probably have, not probably, the text is telling me that you have angels who always behold the face of God. Always see His face continually. They have free access to it. Go to 1 Kings chapter 10, Esther chapter 1. And you'll read some confirmation on that. So we should not despise the leastest, leastest the most obscure Christian. Because he's ministered to by the highest and the noblest of angelic beings. By beings who are always enjoying the favor and the friendship of God. Now as far as the sheep goes, I'm going back and looking at the sheep, I want you to take serious note here that uh, note that they were his sheep when they were lost. Okay? Uh, they were not goats who became sheep. And the text will absolutely, for, absolutely forbids me to say that we go looking for, the, sh the sheep goes looking for the shepherd when it's lost. Wrong picture. It amazes me after uh, nearly 40 years, it still amazes me that modern Christianity, Christianity in the main, continues to look at a picture that God doesn't present. That a goat is turned into a sheep, and the goat, I, I'm assuming, I, you know, I'll take it from, from, what, it, from what I've, I've heard for the past nearly 40 years, that the goat goes looking for the, the shepherd, and the shepherd changes him into a sheep. Wrong picture. No picture like that exists anywhere in the Word. They were his when they were lost. They were a sheep when they were lost. They were not goats who became sheep. And who finds who in the parable? Who finds who? Well, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, well, first of all, he's owned, okay? Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. I've mentioned so many times that we are redeemed in order to be saved. Okay? Not, 
Not every Christian who is redeemed will be rescued, delivered, saved, in the sense of the, of the meaning of the term salvation, saved, the word sozo, you know, we're rescued, we're delivered, we're saved. From what? From what? Well, from guilt. From fear of punishment. Fear of death. We're delivered from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan. We're delivered from death, death itself. Uh, as far as our lives go here, and our, as we walk through life, uh, if you if you are redeemed, you don't have to worry about being your body being redeemed and, and ultimately in the end that you being saved, delivered, rescued from the wrath to come to you know rescued, saved from earth to heaven. You don't have to worry about that. But as far as your walk and your relationship with Him to be delivered from fear, to worry, uh, guilt, not every Christian is. They're already His sheep. Of course He's thrilled when He finds that one. And I think the sheep knows that it's under the care of the shepherd. I want to take a moment this uh, because it is Thanksgiving. And just say a few things about that. There's not a one of us that, that doesn't have something to give thanks for. We're told to give thanks in all things for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Uh, Six years now, this ministry's gone on, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 videos, uh, probably nearly, uh, according to the analytics, YouTube analytics, uh, in six years, uh, about 800 videos, there are about seven, 800 videos, or that, uh, and a, a close to a quarter of a million viewers. That's not a lot compared to a lot of friends of mine who've ministered pastored the same church for 50 years. Uh, but in, in that time, in that short period of time, folks, I've tried to, in all of these teaching videos, I've tried to get people to understand just how much we need to be brought to an implicit trust, a, a trust in God's sovereignty, that He's supremely sovereign. Apart from understanding that, and trusting Him that He is in control of all things in all circumstances, we can't ever be content with all that He allows in our lives for our growth. Uh, our eyes are never to be on our daily earthly circumstances. We'll see that if we get into ever get if we ever get into Second Corinthians. We will be harmed spiritually for sure if we ignore the goodness of God. So I've tried in all this time to, to, uh, to emphasize the goodness of God, the love of God, the severity of the hardships that God designs for our lives. It will often leads many Christians to question that love, to question His goodness. But should that happen, uh, if we begin to do that, then, then the whole purpose for the, for the trial that we're going through becomes diffused and distorted. If we fully trust that He Himself is good and that He's working all things together for our good, I think that we can rejoice in our trials and we can openly praise God his perfect work. I think the, the greatest single area of hindrance to God's growth within us is, is our failure to accept His given plan. There's, you know, many times He will upset the good and godly areas of our lives so that we ourselves will be strengthened 
you know, we find it really difficult at times to accept the fact that that perhaps it was his plan to allow the loss of something or someone. You know, and he did that just to, to cause growth in another believer's life. He did that just to further advance the gospel or the kingdom. Nothing God does is without purpose. And that's, that's especially true when it comes to our own personal lives. You know, we need to understand that, that He owns everything. He could supply a hundred times over what He allowed to be taken away. But no, what we do is we mourn over the loss, never understanding that he, he purposed that loss to occur in order to accomplish His own perfect plan. God's far more concerned about the welfare of the individual than He is about mere material goods. God is neither unconcerned like we tend to think that he is at times or poor you know uh, and this this applies to every area of your life every area of christian trouble hardship uh, christian uh, privation whether it be health reputation relationships goals opportunities, or any other area. You know, the list is endless. His plan, folks, is perfect. And so is His sustaining power for us. Happy Thanksgiving from us here at Blessed Hope Forever to all of you out there who've, who've followed us uh, over the years. Uh, All of this that we're doing is entirely in, in His hands. I want you all to know just how much we love and appreciate you and how much we pray for you constantly. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, the best Thanksgiving ever. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.